Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Altmed podcast series. Great to have your company again. Um, with me as always, my co-host Mitchell Kurtz. I can see him in my little window on the screen here. He's looking fresh. Looks like he's very excited about this discussion, as am I, because we have from Compass Clinics, Dr. Orit Holtzman. Dr. Holtzman, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me today. And you can call me Orit. <laughs> Dr. Thank Holtzman. You, Orit. <laughs> Dr. Orit. <laughs> Dr. Orit. Dr. <laughs> Orit. It's uh, it is definitely a pleasure to have you. Um, for the potentially uninitiated, we'd love to get a little bit of your background to kick things off and, and how you got into cannabis and where you come from and a bit of, you know, your journey to date. So please enlighten us. Okay. Okay. So um, maybe I'll start from where I am today and we can, sure. then <laughs> I can tell how I got there. Um, so I'm, well, now I'm the, I'm the chief medical officer of Compass Lifestyle Clinics. I practice functional medicine with an emphasis on medicinal cannabis. And I'm also the vice president of the Australian and New Zealand College of Cannabinoid Practitioners. So I'm very passionate about both the clinical aspects of medicinal cannabis and also educating other practitioners and, and the public as well about medicinal cannabis. Um, about how I, I got here. <laughs> so I guess it was quite a, a long journey. It wasn't, wasn't very straightforward to, to even get into medicine for me. Um, so it re medicine cannabis really feels like prescribing medicine cannabis really feels like closing a bit of a circle for me. So I guess I started my career um, during my undergraduate degree in biology and psychology at the University of Tel Aviv in Israel. So I'm Israeli, as those of you that are familiar with Israeli accent probably realize by now. Um, and throughout doing that degree, um, I kind of discovered, I guess, that I am fascinated. I was fascinated by how body and mind um, the, the interplay between mind and body and especially about how neurotransmitters and other molecules affect human behavior and emotion. Um, and I did do that degree with the intention of doing medicine after, but um, as, I, as I was doing that undergraduate degree and, and part of what would be similar to doing honors in Australia, um, I did a big research project um, which focused on the serotonergic system and learning and memory. Um, I discovered that I'm, I really enjoy research as well. And I kind of had this struggle between the academic route and going into medicine. Um, and after doing a few other things, so I worked for a year as a flight attendant in an aisle and traveled a bit <laughs> around the world, I did decide to, to do medicine. And I actually did the first year of medicine in Israel at the University of Tel Aviv. Um, but that, that, that idea of, of, of doing research didn't, leave me um, and I kind of you know felt felt quite restless and that in conjunction with the wish to try and live in different places than, than Israel which I always had um, ended up with me taking on a PhD a project in Australia in the University of New South Wales so I moved here with my husband um, we're both Israelis and um, I, I started doing my PhD and when I was looking for a PhD supervisor still back in Israel, when, when you do a PhD, you need to decide on what your topic would be. Mm. And I was quite, actually quite at, by that point, I was quite interested about how some substances um, affect human behavior and emotion. And so I'd looked a little bit uh, um, on MDMA, LSD, and, and even cannabis. Uh, and kind of looked into Ian McGregor's <laughs> uh, lab and I thought, oh, well, that, that looks really interesting. I didn't end up um, doing that for my PhD. I found a, a different supervisor, a fantastic man named Professor Fred Westbrook. And um, I went into more kind of a core neuroscience topic. So I worked on the dopaminergic system and its effect on, um, on, on memory and learning. Uh, but that fascination um, of 
the the effect of those molecules on human behavior was still with me and i even gave a and I, I looked back, it was in 2006, I gave a departmental talk about the endocannabinoid system. Um, and I had no idea then that it can be used as a medicinally, as a, as a medicine, but I was amazed that too. I didn't know before then that there is a, such a thing as the endocannabinoid system even. So I was fascinated by, by that discovery. Um, now going forward, uh, after finishing my PhD, I did end up going into medicine. So I realized I do want to, while well, I'm I love research, I do want to combine it with clinical practice. Um, and I did know that I don't want to practice medicine in just, I guess, the mainstream way. I always wanted to combine more complementary and um, what's considered to be complementary type of medicine as well. And throughout doing my hospital rotations, um, I did training in functional medicine uh, from the Kresser Institute, which is an American institute. Um, and, and there, um, as I'm sure all of you are aware, using cannabis, especially CBD oil, is just another tool in your toolbox. So you can use CBD the same way you use turmeric um, yeah. you know, for, for management of anxiety or depression. It's not, not anything that is um, more difficult to obtain. However, when I uh, graduated from this program and started practicing as a functional medicine practitioner, I realized that in Australia, it's not that simple. And I had no idea on how to even go about prescribing medicine and cannabis. And I kind of put it in the too hard basket as I think uh, many other practitioners have done. However, since I was um, practicing in a bit of an alternative, I guess, way, I had patients that were asking me about medicinal cannabis because they read or heard that it may be beneficial for their medical condition. And I, I didn't want to just decline then, but again, I, I really, I, I had no idea where to start. Um, and then one day I was visiting a friend and at her house, I saw the, I saw the Dr. Teresa Taupik's book about medicinal cannabis. I already heard about um, Teresa from, from patients, actually, because uh, she was practicing in the Blue Mountains in New South Wales, uh, where I live and practice as well, as well as in Sydney. Um, but she was not practicing here anymore. So um, I didn't really know how to get in touch with her. So I asked my friend, oh, I, the, you've, you've got her book. And she was like, yeah, we're friends. I can give you her number. Um, so I called I called um, Dr. Taupik and she was very, very generous with her time and knowledge. And she supported me through my first application to the TGA that to my amazement was approved. Uh, <laughs> I thought it, I, I didn't think I even had a chance. Um, and so I, I did, and in, that's the way how I actually got into prescribing for my first patient. However, I didn't feel like I really know what I'm doing. <laughs> Um, and then one day, I think it was possibly on my Facebook feed, pop up the in a kind of an advertisement to the Medihuana workshop um, mm -hmm. on prescribing. So it's an introductory a whole day workshop to prescribing medicinal cannabis. Um, and this is um, Teresa's uh, workshop. So I very happily uh, registered and, and it was a face-to-face -face, uh, full day workshop pre-COVID days. Now it's, and now we do it online. Um, and it was very practical and very thorough. Um, and I really felt like it was giving me the tools that I need. Um, and at the same workshop also, there was a stand for Campus Lifestyle Clinic. So, um, at this point in time, Campus Lifestyle Clinic was just being established. They didn't even start uh, operating yet, and they were recruiting doctors. And I honestly, I really couldn't believe my eyes because that's exactly what I was looking for. I enjoyed doing my practice on my own, but mm. I always enjoyed working in a team more. Um, and it's, this seems like the perfect opportunity to do that. So I joined Teresa at, at Campus and she, and she was a, a fantastic mentor. She really held my hand through my first patients. And that's been almost three, two and a half years ago now. 
Um, and it's been an amazing journey. So I wasn't expecting to for medicine cannabis to take such a huge part of my practice that is that of, uh, it, it has. And you know, I was planning to kind of like do cannabis half a day a week or something like that, uh, but that <laughs> didn't really happen this way. And that's because of patient demand. And um, so it just it's it's expl exploded. And I've prescribed for hundreds of patients um, over those past two and a half years. Um, and it's been a, an amazing journey. So it's a, such a satisfying way to, to practice medicine. And I'm just really, really grateful that I had the opportunity to, to join this space. Yeah, well, you definitely got involved <laughs> in the teams, the Medijuana, Compass Lifestyle, ANZ, CCP. You're, uh, you're really across just about everything going on within Australia to do with cannabis. Um, but it's, it's very interesting to hear about it coming from the, the neuroscience background because um, that is it's kind of a, a bit of an area of interest for myself. Obviously, I don't know anywhere near the amount you do, but um, I would imagine <laughs> from that type of background, there would be certain um, potentially indications or certain types of patients suffering from um, particular disorders that you would have even more of an insight into than the average GP. So I'm thinking things like uh, mood disorders or behavioral disorders would, are the things that come to my mind. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if that's correct. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but is that, is that something that you see a lot of patients for in, in your, in your work with cannabis? Yeah. So probably pro Chronic pain is probably still the most prevalent indication I see patients for, but um, anxiety would probably be very, very close after. So there are many patients with mental health issues that come seeking treatment with medicine and cannabis. Um, and we see really, really good results. And that's not surprising since the endocannabinoid system is so prevalent in the human brain. So um, so the CB1 receptors are one of the most abundant uh, G protein coupled receptors in the mammalian brain. And um, the receptors, most areas of the brain, but specifically in the limbic system, that uh, is the system that affects a um, mood, a, a mood and anxiety in probably the most addiction in the most significant way. Um, so it's not surprising that the phytocannabinoids that affect um, those cannabinoid receptors can have an effect on, on mood disorders and anxiety, PTSD, and so forth. I also see a lot of kids with autism. Um, and again, seeing, seeing good results, promising results with medicinal cannabis as well. Yeah, so the, uh, yeah, I'm, and I'm imagining there'd be um, there'd be quite a lot of people coming to you for that. Can I'm not sure if you can do this, but are there any maybe anonymized type of stories that you might be able to share of the types of things that you would see coming through and and you know how it changes their lives? You know, a lot of people are searching. You know, a lot of people when they're looking into cannabis, they're they're kind of looking for that social proof of you know, um, finding somebody who had a similar situation or a child with a similar situation and trying to navigate that through through stories. And I think they're, they're really powerful in, in helping people understand, you know, whilst we're still in the in the stage of, to some degree, emerging research within the field, if that makes sense. Sure, yeah. So look, there are many, many stories. Um, I would say that anxiety, in terms of mental health issues, anxiety is probably the condition that has the most uh, dramatic effect with medicine and cannabis. Um, I find combination of um, CBD and THC works the best. And um, for example, I have a young man um, that came to see me that was really in order to dependent, not in a way of addiction, just in um, the way that um, in required medication to function um, in, in his job um, and sleep. So, you know, medications like Valium, a, and medication for for sleep, um, and it took quite it could took quite a while uh, trying quite a few uh, different products and ratios, um, but with combination of cannabis oil and flour, um, he's now of of all his all his medications, he's able to function at work. He's sleeping well and um, doesn't experience all those symptoms of uh, palpitations and insomnia and nightmares. 
and and he really really feels like he he got his life back so sometimes I'm surprised myself so I think maybe I can make a little bit of a difference well no, it's not just me it's it's the, the cannabis really is the is the you know star star of the show yeah but seeing seeing really um people that they, they say themselves they they got their lives back and um, in terms of um children with autism which I guess is a very hot topic um the changes are usually more subtle, but the stories that I have parents come to me and tell me is that, um, again, sleep is a huge factor. So the kids sleep better. They are better. They are better able to follow instructions, uh, becoming a little bit more verbal and just enjoying life more. Um, there's a, a young man, an 18-year-old that um, I've started seeing not very long ago, and um, my mom told me that he went for a bushwalk for the first time in the past eight years. So while it um, might seem like something small for most people, that, that's huge for these kids mm -hmm. and, and their families. So they're able, better able to enjoy just normal life. So they're not going to become neurotypical because they started taking CBD or, or a different formulation of medicine and cannabis. But even those subtle changes can make a huge difference in their quality of life. Yeah, That's and I've heard yeah. the the um, the benefits to the attention, especially in in young children with autism, for example, has almost like a compounding effect. If you you know if their attention is taken. Um, away because they are unable to concentrate then there's other kind of learning factors that get missed is that is that kind of the case as well that you can I guess help steer them towards just concentrating so that they can further soak up what's going on around them from a learning and development perspective yeah yeah it it, it, look, it, it probably does so I guess we can separate it to a um having difficulties to attending their environment because of things like anxiety or just being distracted um, and that I find that CBD has a very sing so I treat most of most of these kids with um, with C with CBD so we usually broad spectrum try I personally try to avoid THC in young kids especially since really we do not know what the effects are on their developing brain and um, so the anxiety and just the the ability to follow instructions, I feel, is very, very significant because if they are unable to follow instructions, they are unable to participate in activities and, and learning becomes much more difficult. So those I find significantly improved. The, um, what you possibly refer to with attention is more the ADHD aspect of the ADHD can be a separate issue to autism, but yeah. also a lot a lot of kids and with autism also um, have ADHD um, yeah. I find that that's a bit more difficult to shift possibly you do need a little bit more THC for that and um, there is not enough actual research in order to pinpoint what is the, the actual um, molecule or process that will affect that the most um, and anecdotally, I see adults with ADHD that improve quite a bit on formulations that contain both CBD and THC, but there is a lot of potential there. So I do find the attention a little bit more difficult to improve, uh, but subtle improvements, definitely. Yeah, and I think um, like thinking about you know younger patients, pediatrics and, and things like that, I, one of the questions that you know most parents have i think and you probably can um confirm if this is the case but is is it safe you know how, how safe is cannabis like um from your perspective as a clinician working with it all the time i mean we we, we have our own views on it we we think it is but it's better to get it from somebody who actually has the qualification to actually speak about it so um in terms of the the safety you're talking about from a cbd and also from thc sure. and then leading on from that i'll have a question i'll let you answer that for, for children first but i have a question about psychosis after that which uh, oh, okay um so I'll start with disqualifying that we don't have long-term data really for medical use. 
So cannabis has been legal to prescribe for about in Australia, especially in, for about three years. So we don't really have long-term evidence from studies or for anything beyond that. And we do, there is a study that was done with Epidiolex, which is a purified CBD that they followed kids for three years. And the long-term side effects that they've seen were the same as the short-term ones, which are very, very minimal. So mostly fatigue and diarrhea and that, that sort of thing. So look, I, I believe CBD is very, very safe, definitely safe in the short term. So as I said, side effects are usually minimal. And what, what we see apart from usually transient fatigue or diarrhea or nausea, some kids can get temporarily a bit agitated if you go up the dose a, a, a bit too fast. And that seems to be kind of an ac activation of their nervous system, which is not necessarily negative, but it might be experienced as negative for them, uh, but that does not last very long. Um, and because it does not have any effect, any psychotropic effect or intoxicating effect, I really do not believe that it has any a lo very long-term um, negative effect. So I think if anything, it would have a beneficial effect as since it's a, a reduced uh, in general inflammation, reduced neuroinflammation. So inflammation in the brain stabilizes the neurotransmitters. It's neuroprotective, it's cardioprotective. So I really can't see how it would have detrimental long-term effect. THC is of course different. So I'm, I'm not against THC. I think it's a very beneficial medicinal molecule. However, there is, we don't really know what are the effects of THC on the developing brain. And there seem to be that there may be some effects. Um, so while again, we can't say for sure, and we, we really need to be careful and consider very, uh, you know, very closely and very carefully if you want to prescribe a child with THC. I do think it's appropriate in some cases if you have a child that is very aggressive, very developmentally delayed, nonverbal, um, and a little bit of THC can help them can help them not harm themselves and others, for example. I think it's completely justified. Or we have older teenagers while their brain is not completely developed yet. And um, again, if you're using it in combination with CBD, it's not the high THC flower that they're smoking, you know, um, from something they got on the street. Uh, it's, it, it would be very, very different. So, but there needs to be a very careful risk benefit calculation. Yeah, right. Oh, well, the other question I was gonna lead on to from that, I mean, we hear a lot of, <laughs> It's a lot of pro cannabis that we speak on these um, podcasts, which is great because we're of that few, obviously, but it is always good to round it out a little bit. Now I want to kind of understand from your perspective, because you know, you have that background in, in neuroscience, the risk of psychosis, it, what, what are the adverse events that, that you do see as a clinician and you know, kind of the traditional view, if you will, of, why cannabis was even illegal in the first place was, you know, down to this kind of psychosis element, I think, or at least was the scapegoat for it being, um, you know, the, the politicization of, um, of cannabis. Um, but yeah, is that a real threat? Is that something that we see that is, is genuinely um, a cause for concern at all? Or, or how, how does that play out in your view? Um, so with the hundreds of patients that I've treated, I haven't, don't have, even one that had a psychotic episode that was triggered by cannabis. And I do treat a lot of patients with THC containing formulations and with THC flower as well. I always balance it with CBD, but really, I mean, there are some patients that had some psychoactive effects, quite mild, uh, but no actual psychosis. So it's not anything that I would consider a psychosis. And um, looking at the evidence, there is some evidence that teenagers that use high THC a flower for a long time may be more um, inclined to develop psychosis or schizophrenia. And there are some studies that, that show the THC um, exacerbated psychotic episodes in a schizophrenic patients, while CBD um, reduced them. So it's something we do, we do need to take into consideration. And um, this is why it's not recommended to prescribe THC, THC to patients with uh, that are schizophrenic or have 
family history of schizophrenia. Having said that, I have two patients that were referred to me by their psychiatrist for management with THC containing formulations, so two schizophrenic patients. And, and this is because they were always already using cannabis and that's the only thing that helped them. So yeah. uh, taking many, many medications, antipsychotics or hospitalized, um, but using illicit cannabis was the only thing that um, reduced mainly their paranoia, uh, which is quite interesting. Yeah. Um, I have prescribed these patients because they, I have the support of their psychiatrists and they both are doing very well. Uh, it, so it's very, very interesting. Yeah, you hear it, 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 it's, you know, really bad for, um, you know, schizophrenia, but then you're treating bipolar, you're treating PTSD, you're treating all these kind of, you know, similar in terms of a, a realm of, of classifications of, of, of issues. It, it just seems kind of counterintuitive in, in by that that mark um, to me, at least. So I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it seems very strange, at least, um, that, that it would be completely outlawed because of this. Although I'm sure, ha have you come across patients that have become a bit anxious with, through too much THC use or that? Yes, yeah, that, that definitely happens. Yeah, so THC can uh, be anxiogenic, so it can uh, cause anxiety. And it, it's very clear from the studies as well that it has this biphasic a, a effect where high doses can cause anxiety while lower doses can reduce anxiety, but also the same dose uh, in a different person can have the opposite effect. So there are very many variables that can um, affect the effect of THC. So they can be genetic, they can be environmental, they can be the strain of THC and it, there can, it can be the dose. So THC, the effect can go both ways. So I have patients that I, I usually, patients that are come for treatment of anxiety, I usually start on CBD predominant formulations. And I have patients that didn't have a very good result from that. And then when we changed over to balanced formulations, had fantastic results. Mm. Um, while others do very, very well on CBD predominant formulations. So it seems like there are those genetic variables are very, very important. Their endocannabinoid tone will be different. The way they metabolize their phytocannabinoids will be different. Their actual... Well, well, I guess while well, the condition manifests in the same way, the underlying pathology may be a little bit different. So there's no, in, in cannabis, cannabis is personalized medicine, really, I, I would say like the, the most personalized medicine I've, I've ever encountered. So really the only way to know how a person will respond is to to try and, and, and go slow and do it in a safe way. However, every person is different. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, um, cannabis has been called the gateway drug um, <laughs> recreationally. And it certainly seems that, um, you know, with, with legalizing access to medical cannabis, we're now potentially looking at um, legalizing access to MDMA and psilocybin being an alternative medicine podcast. We, we take an interest in, um, yeah, all alternative medicines. Have you been following that and have you got any thoughts on the future of um, treating people with um, you know men mental health issues with um, with these kinds of substances yeah so well I'm, I'm far from being an expert on the topic I have been following the field of psychedelic assisted therapies and I think it's fascinating and have a huge potential and um, so while well, cannabis is an amazing tool and um, most people will need to keep taking it daily in order to, for their um, condition to be stable. However, with psychedelic assisted therapies, it seems that you can have a session or a few sessions under the influence of, for example, M MDMA or psilocybin, and, and you don't just take it in a party, you know, you, you actually have sessions with a qualified therapist and, and people seem to, I, mean, I don't like don't want maybe to use the word cure, but they, they, they seem to uh, go into remission at least. So they don't experience any symptoms and it seems for quite a long time. So I think it's it's very, very promising. And, and as I already said, it does need to be done in a very supervised way. If they, those substances can have more side effects uh, than cannabis does. So 
might not be appropriate for everyone, but it's a very, very promising field, and I'm looking forward to it being available to, to, to be available to patients outside of clinical trials in Australia. Yeah, it, absolutely. It's, um, it, you know, some of the reports that I've seen from those MAPS studies, mm -hmm. um, you know, talk about the breakthroughs that people have. And, you know, as you, to your point, they go from managing symptoms to, to actually kind of addressing the root cause um, and really dealing with it and, and per perhaps freeing themselves from needing to take something on a, on a daily basis. So yeah, we're, we're very interested. I'm, I'm, expecting potentially the TGA to make an announcement down scheduling it to schedule late in, um, in December. And, and I guess if that's the case, we might start to see supervised clinical, um, you know, psychedelic medicine centers popping up next year um, at the earliest. And is that something you would be interested in, in doing or? <laughs> yes, yes. Look, I've been thinking. I've been thinking about that, and I've been in touch with my medicine, who's been doing fantastic work and do training um, in those therapies as well. Um, I'm I'm not sure if I'll be. I, I, yeah, I'm not sure what will my role will look like. In, I, I think you would be the shaman. This is, is my understanding. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I want to be a shaman. <laughs> And I don't think I would like to actually do the psychotherapy while well, you can get trained in that. Obviously, it requires a lot of training, but I might be interested in, in supervising the, the medical side of this or be involved in research, um, which I find very fascinating. Chief GP at Burning Man as well. <laughs> as well rainbow serpent something like that witch doctor i'm not a gp <laughs> witch doctor <laughs> witch doctor <laughs> oh yeah no it's it's very interesting we had a chat actually um on the podcast to peter hunt and the the emerging research and that it's the the that quote unquote curative space is extremely interesting um you know uh in terms of ptsd from from mdma uh, treatments and, and and depression for sure from psilocybin it's it kind of seems and i guess this again the neuroscience coming back here but but yeah. rerouting those neural pathways for example right. yeah so well I, I think it from my understanding it again and i'm i just wanted to say again that i'm not an expert there seem to be the two aspects of it, of it. so firstly it kind of in, enables people to re revisit the trauma without that emotional reaction so when the therapy is done without those substances, the, the fear and the anxiety and, and the depression, they kind of prevent them from processing those while you're taking um, those substances, you're actually able to go through, through those uh, therapeutic process without the negative emotional reaction and just um, enables you to do this work in much a, to a, such a much deeper level. But also they are in the term, like, well, like you've mentioned in, in the, um, the neurotransmitter levels, there seem to be recalibration of those neurotransmitters and also production of BDNF. Um, and that and that has a very healing effect on the brain. Yeah, that's no, I, I'm I was just thinking as you were describing all of that, how lucky we are to have a neuroscientist on the podcast. <laughs> and I started to my mind went back to cannabis because I, I just started thinking, I think our audience would like to hear from someone that actually knows what the cannabinoids are, are doing at that level. And I, I'm not trying to, you know, we don't need the most detailed analysis, but if you could um, explain to simple people like Mitch and I exactly how THC causes, you know, the effects that it does or, or CBD makes people feel relaxed and, and potentially get a good night's sleep. What, what's going on in the brain with, with that? Okay, so look, we'll probably require a full day lecture to <laughs> go into all those details with lots of that. Was Derek modulation, Andrew? I thought yeah, you yeah. And what, what's with the cotton mouth? Like, I, I just, I need all of this explained. <laughs> well, I actually, that I, I don't know <laughs> exactly, but I can, I can kind of, you know, give a rough idea on what happens in in the brain. So, um, as I said in the beginning, there are very dense um there are high density of cannabinoid receptors in the human brain so the endocannabinoid system just where your listeners are probably already know that but 
just a bit of a recap uh, for those that may be new. Um, so the, the basic components are the endocannabinoid receptors, mainly CB1 and CB2, uh, the endogenous ligands of, of them. So our body produces its own cannabinoids and they are called, and they're called endocannabinoid. Two main ones are anandamide and 2-AG. Um, and there's the, en the enzymes that, um, the, that um, catabolize and anabolize them so that builds them and degrade them. Um, and um, this seem to be that in for people that have certain mental health issues and even kids with autism have some kind of an imbalance in the endocannabinoid system. So for example, kids with autism, it has been shown that that can only at the moment at least be done in a clinical research environment. They've measured their anandamide blood levels and they found that they were lower um, than kids that that are not autistic. So there is there is clear evidence that there may, there may be some imbalance in the endocannabinoid system. And that and that that can be in the root cause of this mental health or neurodevelopmental issues, um, and using those cannabinoids from the cannabis plant can possibly rebalance that imbalance that have caused these disorders. Um, so the endocannabinoid system is a balancing system. It reduces the brain into homeostasis. So, for example, there is some kind of an exciting event. Let's say. The, the brain, the glutamate is the, the major excitatory uh, neurotransmitter in the brain. Glutamate is released. Um, once enough glutamate has been released and the brain is sensing, okay, there's enough here, uh, endocannabinoids will be released into the, the synapse between the neurons and they will stop the release of glutamate. So you can imagine that there, if there is a deficiency in those endocannabinoids, um, there, then the, that balancing system will not work as it should, and you will have overproduction of for glutamate, for example, and that can contribute to anxiety, and also it's got a toxic effect on the nerve cells, cells themselves. And the, the opposite happens with GABA, which is the, is the calming neurotransmitter is in the brain. So if endocannabinoids are not balanced, those other neurotransmitters will be in, 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 in an imbalance as well. So by affecting those receptors, so for example, we can affect the C, activate CB1 receptor with THC, we can restore that homeostatic effect um, that the endocannabinoids will usually have. Um, CBD affects many other receptors as well. So for example, CBD affects serotonergic receptors um, directly. So it doesn't just, it doesn't affect the serotonin release. It actually affects the serotonergic receptor. And, and many of um, your listeners probably know that antidepressants affect the release of the, so the concentration of serotonin. So Possibly that is how CBD has its anxiolytic and antidepressant effects. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really all about the balance. Also, one of the newer theories is that um, many mental health issues, as well as autism and epilepsy, are actually uh, caused by neuroinflammation. So inflammation in the brain. Both CBD and THC are very strong anti-inflammatories and have been shown to reduce inflammation in the brain. So that is probably a, 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 that's probably play a large role in how they affect those mental health conditions by reducing inflammation in the brain. Very, that, yeah, that's <laughs> a lot of value right there for, for some of the listeners listening, especially ones that understand endogenously <laughs> but um <laughs> yeah, that was great Orin. thank you <laughs> All right. that's that was that was brilliant we um that that's uh that's a really good summary i think of, of how it all works and, and uh, there's definitely going to be some people that get some benefit out of that the other question that i think might tie in with a little bit of an explanation like that would be great to get was is around okay what do i use cbd for and what do i use thc for for example, you know, um, one's good for the immune system, one's good for the, you know, the central nervous system, that kind of thing. So um, if, if you give us a little breakdown of that. I think yeah, and, and, when, and also when to balance the two as well, because uh, I think, yeah, I'm interested in that, that side. Yeah. Um, so I, 
I don't think we can say that CBD is good for one condition while THC is yeah. good for other conditions. I really think that combination of both is superior to using um, each one of them separately. I would definitely not use just THC for anything really because THC while being very beneficial or they mentioned the possible side effects and CBD is able to balance those. And I really see cannabis as a herbal a formulation rather than a medication. So like the medical point of view is that we have those isolated molecules and we, we treat high blood pressure with this molecule and, and we treat a, I don't know, the, the depression with a different one. While um, from the functional medicine side of things uh, that I'm a practitioner of, you have a more of a, you look at a more of a holistic picture and, uh, and cannabis is really a, a constellation of all its parts. So the major cannabinoids, THC and CBD, and all the minor cannabinoids, the terpenes, the flavonoids, they really all work together. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the entourage effect. So um, a lot of practitioners, and there is some evidence to show as well that they work better together. Having said that, uh, <laughs> uh, looking out, so, Initially, it was believed that um, CBD mainly affects uh, out of the brain. Well, so no, that's not correct, that there are CB2, CB2 receptors outside of the brain and CB1 receptors are mainly in the brain. However, it has been found that they are both a, really in all a, organs and systems of the body. Um, so really CBD and THC both affect, um, they have an effect in the brain as well as um, on the immune system. So as I mentioned already, both have an anti-inflammatory effect and also immune regulatory effect. So they both regulate the, the immune system um, as well as affecting mood and behavior. So I, I wouldn't say you use CBD for a autoimmune disease while you use THC for pain. Um, I really do strongly believe that you need the combination of both to get an optimal effect. Um, I've already mentioned that THC, uh, for example, can increase anxiety in some people. So I, um, my approach is that for certain indication, I would tend to start with CBD predominant formulation. For example, anxiety, I would start more people on, on CBD predominant formulations. And then if there is a need, I will and change into, into balanced formulations or increase the THC dose and depending on their response. While conditions like chronic pain for, again, for most people, um, using balanced formulations that have equal amounts of THC to CBD seem to have a better effect. Um, again, and, and uh, for sleep, for example, I found that combination of THC and, and CBD seem to work better than just CBD, for example, and also a much lower dose will be required. So that's, <clears throat> that's important as well, because high, the higher the dose, the higher the cost is as well. Um, so again, there is no hard and fast rules, but there are certain indications when I will use more CBD initially, but other people, some people would also require higher amounts of THC as well. Yeah, interesting. And I have a question based off um, what you said earlier about like cannabis being the most personalized medicine that you've probably dealt with. Um, in terms of it being the most personalized and people getting very different results, um, do you think a lot of that comes down to just the people having a different um, interaction with cannabis versus everybody who's tried a different cannabis product is really getting a different product, so to speak. Like if you're trying, th there's so much variance within cannabis itself that it's very difficult to gauge whether one person trying cannabis is trying anything close to what another person's tried in terms of cannabis. So that's, uh, yeah, that's absolutely true. However, I do try to have a, so to give one product a kind of test it out on a large amount of people. So I can actually, com I can actually see if there is a difference and there is. So I have patients with the same indication on completely the same product or so same company, same concentrations of cannabinoids completely different effects. So of course with different products, you will possibly have different effects as well, because even if it says on the label that the concentration of CBD and THC is the same, 
if it's a different strain of flower, the, the minor cannabinoids will vary, the terpenes will vary. So they can have a, they can have a different effect. And that's, that's probably what we're going into in the future. So while when we will have more knowledge about the, I mean, we already have some, but not close to enough knowledge about what is the different effects of the, of the terpenes and minor cannabinoids. We'll have, I think, formulations where it will be clear what kind of minor cannabinoids and terpenes are present and we can be more um, accurate in the way in the way we uh, prescribe in this way and I, yeah and I agree with you that's very very important so I've got a question then between what you were saying before the difference between such kind of you know traditional medicine isolating compounds versus um, this kind of herbal uh, preparation or that is kind of more holistic in a sense do you think then there's room for taking the isolated compounds from cannabis and combining them say cbd cbg cbc cbn ter different terpenes limonene abis or whatever and putting them together in that way which is still more in line with western clinical isolating but then re kind of synergizing them to back together is that probably where you see it going in the 10, 20, 30 years? Or, or do you think there's always going to be this kind of lab versus flower kind of debate? So some companies are already doing this. So kind of taking it apart and then putting it together in different combinations. And I think that's very interesting. So it might be a way to maximize the benefits from those different molecules. But I also think there is something about taking the the natural the natural plant and using it as it is so we can test different strains and and see what their different profiles are but i think there will always be something we can't capture that is present in the whole plant so might sound a bit woo to some people uh, but i i truly believe that so um i don't think you can ever replicate in a lab what nature manufacturers so um yeah. i think there will always be room for these whole plant formulations but yeah i think it's definitely interesting to see what those uh, uh, combinations that those man-made combinations what kind of effect they can have and and they might have room from the more medical perspective as you say yeah it, it's it is actually it's such an interesting area when you think about kind of that that whole plant extract, if you will, versus recreating a whole plant extract, which is not really a whole plant extract, but it's, uh, it just, yeah, gives a very interesting picture of what might become. And I know it's already being done, but it's, it's just, um, yeah, very interesting to, to think about. Um, I yeah. did another question, but I've actually, it's, I've gone blank. I'm sure Andrew's got one. <laughs> I just, I think it would be very interesting to actually have, just have studies done, proper studies done with those different mm. um, formulations that contain those different molecules, because now it seems like more um, kind of certain conversation. Oh, because they're like, oh, look, look, that looks like that would be a good thing to put, to throw in together. Why? Ah, I just think it looks like a good idea. Yeah. So I think we, <laughs> it'd be interesting to, to see how this develops when we, once we have, just have more knowledge in the field, because there's been, I mean, it's such a relatively new field in terms of the, the amount of time that the research has been done and it's exploding now. So I think we'll know a lot more than the, over the next few years and we can have some very interesting um, data coming through. I'm just as, as someone who's, I guess, just such a, an experienced, um, I guess, cannabis prescriber, do you take an interest in, um, you know, looking at other cannabinoids, CBG, CBN, CBC, does that all form part of your um, prescribing practices or are you generally sort of finding that more, more or less your, your main interest is just figuring out what's going to be the dominant part of the medicine? Is it CBD or THC? And, and how do we, we look after that? So at the moment it is because a, there are not, really many products that are available that allow us to focus on the minor cannabinoids, but there is research that's been done and there are a few, um, there's interesting data coming off the Lambert Institute. Um, and I'm looking forward to 
being able to utilize those minor cannabinoids better. I think it's very, very interesting. Seems to be some evidence for the management of epilepsy with some of those minor cannabinoids. Uh, THCB seems to be effective in managing type 2 diabetes. So there's yeah. really interesting things coming out, but it's not really, at least to the best of my knowledge, readily available as a medicine to be prescribed yet. Yeah, but, no, I, th I think yeah, that's I'm right. I'm looking forward to it, to, to it being available, yeah. Because some doctors I think was talking about um, to me recently, just CBN um, is thought to play a role in, um, in assisting with sleep disorders. And, mm -hmm. you know, so they're saying, you know, why isn't there more products with CBN in it? So, yeah, I definitely think it's an area that's going to come out. And I suppose you've, you mentioned the entourage effect before. You're probably keeping an eye on any studies that, that look at the therapeutic value of terpenes and, and mm -hmm. possibly even flavonoids. Is that, that an area you're, you're interested in? And look, terpenes are already used therapeutically therapeutically with for anyone that practices aromatherapy. So yeah. you know it, that's been known for many many years, uh, and I I think that what is would be interesting to see is because in the medicinal cannabis field, it's the focus is more on um, oral medication, well oral formulations. And there are some uh, terpenes that are available already, terpene formulations that are available for oral ingestion. I would like to see more evidence about the safety of mm. those. So, uh, because they're, they're, they're obviously present um, already uh, in, in the cannabis plant, but probably in much lower concentration than they would be if you kind of add them on to a, a medicine cannabis product or just have a product of a therapy formulation on, on its own. So I just, they have fantastic therapeutic potential. Yeah. I've been seeing one actually the other day. Oh, what is that, Mitch? This is just, just terpenes in, yeah. in oil. It doesn't even, it makes for good podcasting entertainment though, but. <laughs> <laughs> It's got, there's no cannabis in this at all. It's, it's, yeah. purely, it's purely. No, no cannabinoid, it's just a terpene. Alpha pinene, linalool, beta pinene, nerolidol, alpha bisabolol, myrcene, osamine, limonene. Your pronunciation of these terpenes is a lot better. Than I don't know if I'm saying some of them right. I know I'm saying. It was my pretty good. <laughs> No, really. okay. I feel like the person who named all of these terpenes might have been under the influence of THC, actually. But <laughs> yeah, that's, just I, the, that's my I own theory. They were on the psilocybin train I, yeah. I think, at that time. Um, I, I remembered the question I was going to ask before. Very good. The, the terpenes helped. <laughs> yeah, all of a sudden I've got all this amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, should cannabis only be a second line therapy? Or. I, 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 I don't think, I really don't think so. I really don't. So I don't understand why it needs to be second line. I, I really think it's so much safer than a lot of medications that are considered first line. And well, I'm very lucky to not have any chronic health conditions, but for example, if I had chronic pain, I would have much rather take cannabis than opioids or even in the milder uh, pain medications like codeine type of an opioid, but considered quite, it's very, you know, very prevalent. Um, so with its high safety profile, low toxicity, I mean, it's almost impossible to ingest a lethal dose of, well, it's, it's basically impossible with CBD. And, and I calculated for a 10-10 formulation, you'll have to, a 70 kilo person will have to drink five liters of oil in order to get <laughs> To a lethal dose, so I don't think you anyone die from the oil first. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You'll, you'll die from diarrhea first. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so it's it being it's being so safe. I really don't think it it should be second line. But as, I guess as long as it's an unregistered medication, then. That's what it is. Have, having said that, um, the TGA does not try to make it difficult. I really am quite impressed. And the, the TGA in the process of a, a, applying for approval is not as difficult as I thought it, it would be. Um, you can justify your applications in a way that and most people will be able to access it um, under medical supervision. It's I, I think in part, do you think that's 
due to the fact that there's just an overwhelming demand. Like they're, they're, they're completely swamped down there. Are you, are you suggesting they're just rubber stamping SAS applications? I'm not suggesting anything of the like. I'm just <laughs> saying that, you know, uh, it was much more difficult in 2017, for example, 18, to get that through. And now, you know, with the, the you know, overwhelming number of people accessing it and realising, I guess, one, in part, the safety you know, profile of this medicine, but in two, just how do you deal with thousands of, you know, what is it like 12,000 applications a month at the moment, something like that. I don't envy them with their workload, but, um, and I'm, sh and possibly that plays a part as well, but I, I, I really would like to say, I like to believe that they have just seen the, the safety and the efficacy um, of medicinal cannabis. So they're actually, support truly supportive and and think and and do realize that it's a it's such a low risk medication don't even like uh, calling it a medication that yeah. and that what makes the approval process uh, much easier yeah it's hard thinking that it's when you say it like that like a medication versus you know you step over the pond to canada and um or other parts of the world you know that are opening up now and it's literally just something you get at a store, especially CBD. So CBD, when you, you can go to Aldi and get a CBD in Europe, you know what I mean? The CBD formula. It's, it's probably the most affordably priced CBD in Europe, the one at Aldi. But yeah, um, it's way better than the Woolworths, <laughs> which doesn't exist there. But yeah, it's it's definitely, I mean, THC even in Canada, you know, you just go into your dispensary or, or, or in, even in America, uh, I've been there. I've, do they do uh, CBD at Costco? Out of it, can you buy five liters of CBD balanced? You can, yes, you can actually buy CBD anywhere. You just buy it <laughs> online from literally anywhere. Basically, the rest of the world, except maybe parts of Asia. But yeah, it's um, yet it, in Australia, it's been plugged into this system that works around registering, you know, only those drugs which have conducted multi-million dollar trials, phase three to to test for efficacy. It just seems like an odd fit to me. But then, but then in other countries, then they run the problem of quality. So when there is no yeah. no supervision, then the quality control is very difficult as well. So mm -hmm. while I do think it definitely needs to be more accessible, then at least we know what we're getting yeah. at the moment, and that's a huge um, huge advantage. And how do you feel about the other cannabinoids regulation? So CBG, CBC, do you think that they should all be kind of maybe say you do want to keep THC regulated for the minute because it does have a bit more of a risk profile. How do you feel about, yeah, the rest of those in coming to play? Should it be THC by itself or should it be CBD by itself that's kind of deregulated? We probably need to kind of separate the psychotropic and the non-psychotropic ones um, and go, go according to that. So there's there is a huge deal with a uh, with a uh, delta eight THC now in the US. It's just kind of a backdoor into uh, buying <laughs> psychoactive gummies in the petrol station. But then you get kids, you know, eating those gummies and and end up in hospital. So uh, we do need to be a bit careful about that. But I I don't think that other non psychoactive cannabinoids need to be highly regulated um, it's, in that it's really way. just thc9 and 8 that are yeah yeah, yeah. the rest of, i mean uh, unless you you've read otherwise I, I from my understanding there's no other psychoactive components to cannabis other than the tel the thc in 8 or 9 is that yeah, I, in, off the top of my head, I think you're correct. I'm not 100% sure about that. There are many, many yeah. minor cannabinoids, so I might be I'm, missing I'm never 100% sure, yeah, which is correct. Never, I'm, I'm not <laughs> correct, even when I'm 100% correct. So, um, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I agree with you. And for the record, for everyone out there, I'm not even a doctor, even though I <laughs> really is. And she's still not correct, 100% uh, confident, let's say. Um, but yes, I, I think there's been quite a lot of nuggets in this conversation. Andrew, do you have any uh, outstanding questions that uh, you, you were looking to have answered? Um, no, I just, I, well, sorry, I say no, and then I go and ask a question. I have one more for you, Orit. I, um, I just wanted to just kind of ask you about um, the potential for a recreational market in Australia. I mean, 
I know it might seem strange because we've just been talking a lot about the medical application of cannabis, but just as a, as a doctor that's in the space, what do you think? Do, do you think it's something that Australia should do? I'm, I'm, I'm very supportive um, of this. Um, so obviously for adults, uh, but mm. cannabis is a time from, from then alcohol and, you know, alcohol is an essential service yes the, the liquor show has to stay open because the andrew is it is yeah <laughs> no i already told mitch that if it does become legal we're going to start our own chain of cannabis stores called can murphy's so um yeah just flagging that one but anyway um I'm sure we can think about it better yeah. later. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yes i definitely i really do truly believe there is a room for it and a uh, Look, I have patients that I feel they've been they've been using cannabis for years and years and years, um, and they and they come to me because they want to use it legally. However, they don't really want to have a doctor telling them what to do. And I was like, if we just had a dispensary, they can go there, they can get what they want, and just leave me alone. <laughs> so uh, they don't enjoy me telling them what to do. I don't enjoy trying to tell them what to do. Um, and I think people should have that option. So for uh, for people that want to use cannabis um, as a therapeutic agent, um, I think there is a lot of advantage. There is a big advantage for having. Um, a practitioner supporting you in the process. However, if you want to use it recreationally um, or you really feel like you don't benefit from that supervision, I think there is a room for those dispensaries as well. So yeah. I would like to see both still in existence yes. because I do feel like a practitioner practitioners have a lot to contribute to oh. when you use them in a therapeutic way um, but yes I am fully supportive of people having being able to have access uh, to to cannabis uh, on their own as well and look I mean obviously there there is risk I mean you already said you shouldn't pre prescribe THC for uh, people with schizophrenia however what prevents them from going to a dispensary and, and buy cannabis but they can do this already and they do so I don't think any anyone that wants to access cannabis or can now yeah. as well illegally uh, we're having um, legal access with products that are higher quality and that have that I think there should be some kind of a quality control. So, like with medicine cannabis, they will, that people will be able to know that what they buy is not contaminated by heavy metals or bacteria, yeast, yeah. small. Like it could could be a food standard or something. Yeah, like yeah. alcohol. Yeah, it's important. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. And I think already that stigma is coming down. You know, if you're out in public or if you're at a park and you get that smell and you're like, oh, oh, there's somebody over there. And then it's just like, okay, like everybody, nobody really looks at it in a, well, at least amongst my peers and the age group that we're in, it's not really seen as a really antisocial thing anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think America, North America has done a lot for that um, kind of transition and people just kind of, you know, so what kind of thing. Yeah, and it's it's a harm minimization strategy. And there's already data coming from the US that the states where cannabis is legal, you see less death from opioid overuse. Oh. Um, and I prefer that someone would smoke a joint rather than become intoxicated from alcohol. So yeah. I I I do I do really think that there is a room for that. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I think that has been a fantastic little chat and very informative. <laughs> There's a lot of people that will get some benefit out of that. So thank you very much for your time. Yeah, uh, thanks, Orit. That was great. Dr. Orit. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Orit. Yeah. Thanks for um, having me. <laughs> yeah, it, it was a pleasure to chat. And um, hopefully we get to do it again in the future sometime. So um, we'll not, we're going to put you on the spot and say, please come back on in, in <laughs> something and you can pressure it into saying yes. <laughs> sure. I would. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> right. Always great to chat with, um, yeah, with, with like-minded people and yeah, your insights Absolutely. were just amazing or So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for uh, having me. Have a good pleasure. Weekend. We'll speak again yeah. soon. Cheers. Bye-bye. <laughs>